Out of the Ordinary Insights, brought to you by Investec Specialist Bank. You're watching Captains of Industry here on CNBC Africa, and I'm chatting to Jeff Nemeth, who is the CEO and President of Ford Southern Africa, as well as the President of the American Chamber of Commerce South Africa. Thanks so much for your time. You here. arrived 2010, and that was after a sojourn in Asia, around about nine years, where you worked with an incredibly productive labor force in the Ford fold. When you arrived in South Africa, people warned you that you were going to encounter unskilled, unproductive labor. What is the reality? Well, it's, uh, it's interesting. The, the, I'd say the biggest challenge in South Africa that I found was understanding how to connect with labor. And what I found when I went out into the plant, um, I went out and just kind of stood around and watched for a while, right? And, and just to see how the plant ran and how people worked and the pace of work and the types of jobs they were doing and how many people we had. And so I'd spend 10 minutes just standing and watching one area of the line. And I did that for, for about two hours and um, in different parts of the line. And finally somebody walked up to me and said, you're the new CEO, aren't you? And I said, uh, yes, I am. And he said, do you mind if I just show you something? And I said, sure. So we went over, looked at his workstation, and he said, if I put this part on before this other part was put on, I think I could put it on with higher quality and, and more easily. And I said, wow, that's a great suggestion. Have you told your supervision about that? And, and they said, yes. And so I said, well, take me over and introduce me to him. So he introduced, took me over and introduced me, and I said, thanks a lot. I'll take it from here. You can go back to your station. And um, so I had the supervisor then follow up with the engineer. I said, did you tell him yes? And so we went and talked to the engineer. And uh, the engineer said, well, you know, we, we haven't really looked at that. And I asked the supervisor, how long have, have you had this communication? And he said, about four months. And I said, you haven't had time in four months to look at this. And he said, no. And I said, okay, you have four hours. I'll be back by the end of the day, and I want you to do an evaluation on whether that's a good suggestion or not. And I'm not saying whether you should do it or shouldn't do it. You're the engineer. I'm not. So I went back four hours later. He said, yes, it's a good suggestion. I said, okay, I want it implemented tomorrow. And the next day I went out, and the worker came up to me, and he said, thank you so much for helping. And, that, and then every time I went to the line, people would run up to me and make suggestions. So it was really about you getting involved in the value chain yeah. after observing. Yeah, but the, the point was we weren't listening to our workers. We were paying them for their arms and legs and we were getting their brains for free. And that communication just wasn't there. So I facilitated the conversation and the communication and then after that day, then we actually put in place team building activities, coaches. You sent more than 200 of your workers to India, to a plant in India for some two weeks. Was that a worthwhile exercise? Oh, that was fantastic. Um, we tried to decide where to send them, and we had a couple, su we had a couple suggestions. One you would have thought Germany. Germany. That was the number one suggestion. Send them to Germany. It's what BMW and Rosalind did. Um, it was our most efficient plant. And then we said, you know what? It's going to be difficult for our workers to connect with German workers, given the difference in pay, the difference in education, the difference in living, uh, standard of living. So what's another really good plant that we have that our workers would be more easy to connect with the work? And so so we choose an emerging market territory. Exactly. So we went to India and uh, sent for two weeks, for t groups of 20, for two weeks, 10 groups. So about 200, actually about 12 groups because it's 240 altogether. And, uh, and they spent two weeks working hand in hand with the workers in India. And the nice thing about the workers in India was they were very warm and inviting, wanted to teach. Our guys wanted to learn. For 239 of them, it was probably the first time they ever left South Africa. We had to get them passports. And, um, and so it was a big deal to them. They embraced the opportunity. They came back as thought leaders and opinion leaders. So an effective skills transfer took place over that two-week period. Absolutely. And, uh, and when they came back, they formed teams and they started running their own business. So each team of, team of 20 or 30, we call them natural work groups, became managers of their part of the plant. 
What I find really interesting, Jeff, is from a quality perspective, you used to be at the, well, South Africa, now this is not you, you used to be at the bottom of the log, pretty much close to the bottom from a quality perspective. 18 months you took to turn it around and you're now really at the top of the log, pretty much near the top of the log when it, when it comes to that quality. Was it just about that engagement and motivation with your workers? Well, it, it has to start from people caring about what they're doing and wanting to do a good job. And I believe we had that, but just weren't harnessing it. The second thing we were able to do is bring four global quality systems into, into play here in South Africa. We were always, a, we call it a CKD, complete knockdown plant, which doesn't really have the systems that a full manufacturing facility does within Ford. And because you build so many different models, we were building six different nameplates, two, three, four, five thousand of each one. Now we're building one nameplate, the Ranger, um, and 70,000, 75,000 of those. So we bring all of the Ford high volume, single platform manufacturing practices into this plant for the first time. And what it does is it connects the customer with the person putting the now that you're almost three years down the line in your South Africa adventure, how does the profile of the worker within the Ford fold compare to the profile of the worker that you encountered in Asia? Yeah, I'd say the, um, the, the passion for the business is equal. I think the, uh, one of the things that's that's an advantage in South Africa, frankly, is the worker in South Africa. That working in a car plant is a highly desirable job in South Africa. In some other countries, it's not nearly as desirable. It's, it's maybe lower on the feeding scale than it is in South Africa. So um, one of the things we measure is advocacy. And w do our workers, we ask them the question, would you, would you um, recommend a job at Ford for somebody that, in your family? or your neighbors. And we've got one of the highest um, incidents of yes to that question anywhere in the Ford fold. So one of the things that's, um, that's really evident when you walk through the plant is the energy and the excitement of our workers to actually be working at our plant. And, and when you can harness that and push it in the right direction, it's I'm really I'm going to push powerful. you a little hard on this. Would you rather choose an Asian worker over a South African worker? That, you know, that's a tough call to make. Um, there's pros and cons to each. The uh, Asian workers are generally better, better skilled. Um, they can problem solve on the spot. Um, so you don't need as much management and you don't need as much resource for the Asian workers. So you tend to have better efficiency, less workers per car built. Um, on the other hand, you don't have the passion for the, for the job and the desire to, to work in, in the automotive plant for your whole career. It's an interesting point because obviously labor productivity is, is such a, a crucial issue within South Africa and we spend so much time debating it on the, the news desk. So thank you for your insights on that front. Let's move now to the, the general, uh, still with the labor scenario, the strike environment and how you are managing to navigate that territory. Yeah, the, um, the strike environment is becoming, the, the difficulty with the strike environment is becoming more global, right? And before when we built our, our plants in South Africa, and all of us, um, all the OEMs, our plants in South Africa built primarily for South Africa. And um, up until the MIDP, which started in 2000, I think, um, which started pushing export, and now the APDP, which takes it to the next level. And now all of the OEMs are exporting. So my customers are in Western Europe, in, in um, the Middle East, in, fa in fact, in, in the Americas and in Asia as well. I've got, that's where our rangers go. And so when we have a strike now, it's very visible in the boardrooms in Detroit because people aren't hitting their sales numbers. And it completely disrupts the supply chain. Completely. And, uh, and also our, our supply chain, what's happening now, we, we, we're back to work after a three-week strike, which, um, which was difficult to describe to, to Detroit, obviously, um, but now the suppliers are out, and what, when we introduced the Ranger here, one of the things we wanted to do was create jobs in Africa and leverage the opportunity that, the, that having this huge APDP export plant 
was allowing us, so we leveraged it to the supply base. And we gave the South African suppliers contracts for our plants in Thailand and our plants in Argentina. So you embraced the manufacturing entity within the South African fold? Exactly. And drove efficiencies and drove quality because um, we needed it for our plant and we thought, well, let's leverage that. And uh, the problem now is the suppliers are down starting on Monday. And if they shut down Argentina or Thailand, it's going to be a major emotion. So what are the, the repercussions for you? You talk about Detroit and the boardroom in that territory. Are you under pressure at the moment? Um, well, you're always under pressure, right? Enough is never, uh, more is never enough. Um, but the, I'd say more so than normal, um, and primarily because it's difficult to understand, right? We, we actually came up with an agreement with the union two and a half weeks before the workers went back to strike or went back to work from the strike. And it was a two and a half week process just to go through all of the procedures and signing the document to get the workers back to work in most developed. But it meant nothing at the end of the day then if they went back on strike. Um, oh, the component suppliers? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So it's, so all that time that we spent um, and then the day that we went back, the suppliers went on strike. So it's just a vicious, the use, it's a vicious right? cycle. The use? So that's, you can imagine people in developed countries like the United States or Europe they don't understand this. And so it's very difficult to, uh, to explain, and, and it really gives a bad reputation. How much will they tolerate? I suppose that's the key question here, yeah. Jeff. Yeah. Um, the good thing is, the, I, I like to look at the glass as half full. Um, the half full view of this is uh, corporations tend to have um, short memories. So if we can get back to work quickly, build quality cars, deliver to schedule, hit our cost targets, and not have any labor actions for the next two years, three years, while our contract period goes on, we'll rebuild our reputation. And, and, we'll, and, and the big issues are going to be coming up with the next level of investments, right? So um, already we're starting to talk about the next Ranger investment. And you know, there's two other plants. And if we continue to have situations where we're being disrupted by either labor or other external it factors. It puts your long-term plans in jeopardy. Exactly. And what's the return on investment? If you can't count on the plant running every day as scheduled, then you aren't getting the return on investment. And you, it's really a dollars and cents calculation. So we're going to be down for six weeks this year. That's 15 to 20 percent reduction in, in return on investment. Do they make decisions quickly in that Detroit boardroom? I mean, how much time have you got? Is there anything that you can do or will it just be the end of the line? Well, I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm going to Detroit next week, um, uh, unsummoned, but on my own. Proactive. Proactively to sit down and talk to them about the challenges and the opportunities. And the opportunity is South Africa is the most um, developed country in Africa. And Africa is very topical. President Obama was just here, talked a lot about opportunities in Africa. Um, there's a delegation, Minister Davies is on his way to Washington, I believe next week, to talk about renewal of AGOA and other opportunities for South Africa. And you've got an emerging continent with a billion consumers, projected to grow to 1.6 billion in the next 15 years. Um, and the you youngest, can't ignore those numbers. The youngest population in the world, 19 years old, average, average age. So all of those people are going to be entering the purchasing, you know, the, the part of their lives when they spend money. Um, and so, like you said, you can't ignore the numbers. And we're here. We're strategically located. We've been here for 90 years. Um, and, and it gives us a great platform to use to take advantage of the growth in Africa. You're watching Captains of Industry and I'm speaking to Jeff Nemeth. He's the President and CEO of Ford Southern Africa. Stay with us.